cursing growing hair my entire life and it hasn't paid off. So oh, no. not working. <laughs> On that note, going live. Have a great conversation. Thank you, Karen. It's time for Tycoons of Small Biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Mance, are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. I am Austin Peterson. I am joined today by my co-host, Landon Mance, as always, and special guest, Kobe Baker with Maya Holdings and Alderus Mortgage in Las Vegas, Nevada. Kobe, thanks for being with us. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, we're excited to have you. We, uh, if you're okay with it, we usually like to have our guests tell a little bit about themselves personally to get started, you know, talk about your family, talk about maybe, you know, your beginnings, where you went to school, what you studied, how you got to where you are today, so to speak. Uh, you didn't forewarn me of that, so uh, I'll do my best to uh, make it sound interesting. Um, so I think probably the most interesting thing about me is that I have been uh, with my wife for 27 years. I'm only 45 years old. So that's an unusual uh, fact. I have no children other than dogs. And I started my first business when I was 19 years old, um, high school graduate, college dropout, went to the University of Utah, played a little basketball uh, under Rick Majerus, and then decided that uh, business was something a little more up my alley. So uh, from there, it's been a string of companies, some very long, some a little shorter. And uh, I think that's probably, uh, in a nutshell, it. Yeah, that's kind of the entrepreneurial way. So you, you mentioned University of Utah, Rick Majerus, and based on your a age, I'm thinking you were there around the same time as Keith Van Horn. Is that? Yeah, uh, uh, he, was, he was a little bit after me. A little bit after you. I'm, okay. I'm that old. Yes. <laughs> well, you and I are the same age, so I guess maybe I'm just remembering how old I was when he was there. But uh, yeah. yeah, no, I, I'm a family friend, Chris Burgess, that was there after a stop at Duke as well. And so we've, we've got some ties to the University of Utah. My nephew actually plays football at the University of Utah right now. Oh, nice. Great school. Uh, a lot of good programs. Salt Lake is a great place to go to school. That's for sure. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Great uh, place to spend some time in the outdoors and, and that sort of thing. So absolutely. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's jump right in and talk a little bit about uh, kind of what brought us together today. And, and the reason that uh, Landon and I wanted to have you on the show, obviously, your story is an interesting one. And, um, you know, I think nowadays, our conversations tend to to talk a lot about what's going on with COVID-19 and kind of just, you know, everything that's, that people are dealing with. And, and we, of course, want you to touch on that if, if you'd like to. But, you know, first of all, let's kind of take a step back and, and give us your philosophy on what you think, you know, business represents in modern society. What's the, what's the purpose of business today? Well, I think that, um, that we've gotten a little bit away from the, the true capitalist roots. Um, usually... In the beginning, I think business um, was really set to be something to serve the community. Um, at the end of the day, that's how this all, how we moved away from the old systems of shells and bartering and things like that into the new system of uh, the monetary systems that, that we use in today's day and age. Uh, and capitalism was a way to, to have people engage with the community, provide services in the community that were beneficial to everybody, created, you know, not to sound corny or anything, but created a, a big circle as to how things are done. I think We've got a little bit of weight. Well, if we go long enough in this conversation, my true opinions will come out, which I think we've gotten a lot uh, away from that sort of mentality with the way that we function in capitalist society right now. But um, <clears throat> I think that that's, you know, I got into business because 
of that community component, of that value component, of bringing something to somebody else, not necessarily always for what I could get out of it. Yeah, and, and I agree with you. We talk about that a lot where, you know, especially in the media today, I think business owners get a bad rap. We get, we get seen as, you know, greedy people that are just out for ourselves and not really, you know, thinking about the fact that we're providing jobs to many people. We're, we're doing things in the community. We're, we're allowing people to have incomes that, that then push the economy forward. I mean, there's a lot that is done by being a business owner that we don't get the credit for a lot of times. And it's, I think it's a tough, tough pill to swallow sometimes. Well, Austin, I think, I think a lot of that stems from the way businesses function. If you, if you look at the way media and the way businesses talk about themselves, everything is, a, is generally boiled down to a component of how much are we growing? How much are we making? It's become this culture of um, basically how fast can we grow? Are we growing? And how much are we making? And I think at the end of the day, that sort of supports this idea of what you're saying that, that it can be tough because you have one message of, hey, we're doing a good thing, we're providing, we're providing jobs, we're creating economic stability, we're doing these things, but everything that we talk about in our businesses aren't necessarily geared around how, how much good we're doing for the people that work with us, how much good we're doing for the people that work for us, and what are we actually accomplishing inside the community. That message seems to be lost in today's day and age, if, if, uh, if you want my honest opinion on it. Yeah. Uh, so maybe clarify that for me. Do you think that the business owners themselves are doing a poor job of portraying what they're doing or it's not being portrayed enough by the media? Clarify that for me. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's twofold. I, I think ultimately as a business owner or um, a CEO, the message that you put out there can be altered. We can put out whatever message we choose to put out there. I think the media supports the idea that everything is based upon growth, it's based upon our revenue. It's based upon year over year. But if you look at what people talk about, that's pretty much all you'll see in business. I pull up any industry publication for any industry, pull up any uh, email that you get, any email list, and it will talk. Those companies will constantly be touting, we're growing faster than ever. Um, we were, our year over year numbers are better than last year. Yet you're not going to hear a whole lot from either business leaders or the media that talk about, Hey, what's your, what's your attrition rate of your employees? How, what's the, what is the lifestyle of the people that work for you? Uh, what are the things that you're doing in the community to improve the community? We just don't focus on that. And I think that that's something that's lost in today's day and age. And it's really something that's important to me to bring back because endless growth is, to me, is not a good thing. I don't think endless growth should be the end game of anything as far as size, learning and getting better, providing services and doing good things, I think is critical. But the growing for the sake of growing and increasing profits, just I'm just never going to be on board with that mentality. Yeah, I think you got a couple of guys who, who agree with you there. I mean, we, we try to live and breed the philosophy of serve the client first, last and always and let everything else take care of itself. Um, and I don't know that Landon or I, either one of us care about you know, growing to, to a large organization. We care about serving the, the business owners that we work with. And as long as we're able to do that and do it as well as we can, of course, we want to take care of our families. We want to employ other people. We want to do what we can as well. But then we spend an awful lot of time serving in the community as well. And if, if, if I can do that, that's good enough for me. I don't need to build a huge empire. Yeah, I think that's a, I mean, that's a critical um component of creating some change in today's business environment is understanding that that there's a quality quotient here that actually matters there is a everybody is so focused on quantity uh, that a lot of businesses lose sight of what they're actually doing and I, I don't think everybody I, I don't think it's necessarily the intention always but I think that it because it's the standard narrative I think a lot of people get pushed and, and end up maybe starting with a little bit more altruistic ideologies and then, you know, they, they lose it and they move away from that just because the, that standard narrative is so loud in today's day and age. Yeah. Well, I know Landon wants to jump in and, and ask a question or two as well, but may, let me ask you a follow-up to that. So what are you guys specifically doing at any of your organizations that you'd like to share with us that, that is different where you're leading with, you know, whatever, 
Yeah, so, so been beyond I mean, we, profit. That's a great question, and I think it's it's you know it's twofold. It's not only what we're doing inside the organization, but it's what we're doing outside the organization as well. One of the the critical things for um, our our mortgage bank, and I own several companies under uh, under my holding company that do very different things. Uh, but our mortgage bank has some very unique philosophies on how we do things. Um, one is that um, we truly want to be the, the mortgage company that wants to see our clients debt free. And that, is, seem, that could seem to be an oxymoron because we are a finance company. I think the critical thing to remember and this to kind of to tie it into what you're asking me, um, just because somebody's going to go out and they are going to go into debt to get a house doesn't mean their strategy needs to be leveraged across the board for the rest of their life, basically. There should be, um, you should have somebody on your side in the mortgage business that's helping you understand that very large debt instrument that you're using, helping you plan on your financial future, working with people like Landon, like yourself to, to ensure that you have an overall strategy for reducing your debt and not just living your entire life in debt. One of the things that we've seen, I've been doing the, the mortgage side of things for 17 years now. Um, the US is a very uh, standard individual. The US is very leveraged. They have a significant amount of credit card debt, significant amount of auto debt, and a very, very small amount of savings. You guys probably know these numbers better than I do, uh, but I, there are some crazy numbers for the, the average savings for an adult, American adult over 55. It's it's frightening how low that is. Um, so that's one of the ways where, um, as a company, we're building our culture around the pro not only the process of advising people and partnering with great people like Landon and yourself, but also in building it into our systems as to how we're following up and checking in with people. How are we creating programs that incentivize people to stay out of debt? We're using some really cool borrower intelligence and things like that that most people in our business use to constantly churn and refinance people. We're using that same technology to figure out when somebody's going in debt, when we know that they didn't want to go in debt, to call them and basically give them a nudge and say, hey, what's happening? How can we help? What advice can we give you? How can we line things up? I think that's a good example of the business actually serving the community, not just the business serving the bottom line of the, the corporation, basically. So I think... Um... I think one of the, well, let, let me speak for myself. One of the things that I struggle with uh, in, within kind of my generation is um, collaboration. And I mean, true collaboration, a win-win mentality. What can I do to help serve you, to help you grow your business without this expectation of, of reciprocity? Um, and I can just kind of a, a plug for Kobe and, and his team. Um, you know, they, they are a group that the first time you sit down with them and have a conversation, it takes 20 minutes to know that what they are doing is, is different because the feel that you get, the questions that they ask, the conversations that they engage in, it's different. And they, they want true collaboration which leads me into my next question for you, Kobe. What are you doing? What is your organization doing to involve the next generation uh, of, of thought leaders, you know, in, you know, kind of your business sector? Yeah. So uh, first of all, thank you, Landon, because we work very hard on, and I want to touch on that subject first. So if I get too far off point, bring me back. Um, I think that's another thing, you know, to tie into what Austin was saying about, what is business? What's the purpose of business? Too many people are looking for something in return. If we start to, to look as a business, what can my business do for your business that's going to add true value to what you're trying to accomplish? Which means you do have to be very, very comfortable. You have to look for alignment because you want to help those you align with. But I think that's a true component of, of traditional, original capitalism that's also lost in that there's very little collaboration business to business in, in saying, how can we really help one another accomplish a, a much greater goal? So I agree with you 100% on that point. <clears throat> um, across all of our businesses, I have two partners. 
in all of our business, both my wife and my brother, I'm lucky to have had, you know, over 17 years in partnership with two people that I can trust um, pretty much explicitly um, or implicitly, excuse me. Um, and one of the things that's really critical for us is bringing in the next generation of thought leaders. How do we traditionally in a business, people look for people that have experience in that line of work, especially in I will use the mortgage industry um, as one of them. They're, you're going to look for people who have been in the business because it's a lower lift for people. Our average, the average age of a, of a frontline salesperson in the mortgage business is 56 years old. And it's not getting any younger. Um, so a, a lot of what we've done is we've partnered with um, children's organizations, community organizations uh, to basically create talent funnels into our internship programs, into training programs. Basically, we're trying to bring people from outside of the business inside the business. That way we can teach them the values, the, the information that we want them to know that's gonna be valuable to not just growing an individual bottom line, but actually growing through a more organic way, which is doing the right thing. When you do the right things, when you provide great service, when you give great advice, and you couple that with providing a very, very low price for whatever it is you're doing, it does go against a lot of the, the modern day business principles, which is don't undercut your services. Well, there are certain things like a mortgage where I disagree with that mentality going into today's day and age. We should be using um, youth technology and some other, um, some other tools that we have at our disposal to create more efficient systems that allow us to reduce cost on a mortgage. A mortgage is a commodity. I am not a commodity. Advisors are not a commodity because the information they give you, you're not gonna get everywhere. But the, the mortgage instrument, you can go to a, a hundred places the second you shut this radio down and get a mortgage. So technically that's a commodity. What you get along with that is the component that you have to add that, that, that sort of decommoditizes the mortgage. So, Bringing in young people, showing them, teaching them from ground up. Uh, right now, over 50% of our team is under 28 um, in this particular business. That's a huge deal in our business. Now, granted, the rest of us are, uh, we're gray hairs, right? So you got to have the people that know the business to teach the youngsters. So um, really to me, it's bringing in a group. I think that the, the, the modern or the millennial is kind of, undershot a little bit. I think everybody thinks that these, they're entitled and they have a, a lot to say about millennials, but they're also very idealistic. They have watched people chase the wrong things and they do have some sort of idea that there's a better way of doing things. For me, that makes a perfect target because you get the, the innovation, you get the buy-in and you get people that aren't just saying, I need to make as much money as I can as fast as possible. And I've seen that firsthand. Hopefully that answers your question. That's a little long-winded way to do so, but. No, yeah, no, absolutely. So kind of, um, you know, other than, you know, I kind of express my, uh, my challenge of, of, you know, collaboration, but, you know, other than that, you know, what, what would you say kind of in your experience, in your opinion, what would you say is kind of one of the bigger threats, um, you know, to the next generation? Um, I, anybody who knows me will attest to this. I think that rampant consumerism is a big issue right now, I think. And in the world that, that we both occupy, because we both occupy financial services, um, my other ventures are uh, manufacturing and restaurant bars, stuff like that. Uh, but even in those, there's, a, there's this component of consumerism that is, is sort of prepped and pushed from the time that you're very, very young. And that goes back to my comment to Austin about the lack of savings that the average American over 55 has. That's because we're spending it all. We're, we are literally taught that we should have the next thing the moment it comes out. If, it, if you did any, uh, I think like, what was it? A couple of weeks ago, the Senate did a hearing with Apple, Google, Facebook, I like, like the big five, Amazon. And when you look at the numbers that this that, that they represent of the economy. They, they would be like the fifth largest economy in the world, those five companies. All of those are, are geared firmly around versions of consumerism or pushing consumerism and advertising and da big data and all, this, all of these things that drive basically purchase habits. 
I honestly think that is the biggest, I, I, not to get on a soapbox, but I believe that basically the majority of Americans, if not, you know, people across the world are walking into some sort of slavery through indebtedness, basically. You never get out of the wheel. And that's what I try and teach people um, that come into our organization, people that come into contact with us. There's a critical um, ideology. It's not, it's not how much you make, it's how much you spend. I know people that make a million dollars a year and spend 990,000 of it. I also know people that make $100,000 a year and spend 50,000 of it. Who has more money at the end of the year? It's not that, not that hard to do that math. And I think that's part of what our mentality is with the mortgage group, with how we're actually not only teaching people new industries and new skills, the younger people, we're also teaching them how to manage their money, how to look at things, how to not, how to, how to be in an environment where our only, where our sole purpose is not to just buy, spend, get another TV, get another car, those types of things. So not a very popular business approach, I would say, but to be honest with you, I don't really care. Yeah, I don't know that it matters that, that it's popular. I think that you're absolutely right. We've, we've got an entire group of people that are living well beyond their means, right? And I don't know the exact number, but I do know that the exact, that the, the number that people have saved at age 55 or older, like you said, is less than the average household income for one year. Crazy. And yet, yeah. And yet they're 10 to 15 years away from supposed to supposedly retiring and living off of the money that they've saved for the next 20 to 30 years. Right. And so it is a big, big issue. And there is this consumerism that's pushed where everybody believes that they have to have the newest thing right away. They have to have, you know, the brand new iPhone that's coming out. I mean, I heard this morning and the new iPhone's coming out in October. They were, and this is, this is actually crazy. They, they mentioned on the, on the TV this morning on the news that Apple's market capitalization is larger than all of the companies combined in the Russell 2000 index. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so one company bigger than two thousand others, right? And those are smaller companies, granted, but they're large enough to be listed on a public exchange, right? So it, it it's it's crazy to think about that, but yeah, it, that's the thing is everybody's going to go out and pay another fourteen hundred bucks to get the brand new iPhone five G, blah blah blah, you know, in in October, and it does lead to to an issue. Right. And, and it, it's just about simple principles. So let me ask you this, and, and this isn't something we'd planned on asking you, but beyond you grabbing them, right. Cause people really can't come to work for you until they're 18. Right. Yeah. And, and so you, you can't become a loan officer until you're 18 years old. You have to go through the education that, you know, the test, all that kind of stuff. What do we do to get to the kids younger? Right. I mean, my, my daughter is 17. She's a senior. She says, she says, I know how to do complex mathematical, mathematical, complex mathematical calculations. I just took AP physics, but I have no idea how to balance a checkbook, how to get a credit card, how to buy a car. It's not. Yes. That so there's another, I mean, I don't want to get too far off point, but yeah, our education system is significantly flawed. Um, you know, obviously we, you, like you said, we have plan on talking about that, but there's a problem, and I'll, I'll tell you one of the things that, that, that we do, we sponsor Dave Ramsey's high school program uh, at various high schools around here in Las Vegas, which they go in and people sign up for it. It's basically a 90-day course that teaches financial literacy to high school students. Um, and that's one of the, cr the, the critical things that I believe in. We also, I go and I do talks for kids anywhere from 12 to, to 22 um, through the Inspired Children Organization and a couple of other children's organizations uh, where, you're, where you're having this opportunity to uh, attack this problem earlier. And I think part of the problem is, is our education system isn't set up to really prepare us for real life. And that's, that's another issue that, that I sort of have that I don't have time to take on myself. But if you think about it, your daughter's a great example of that. She's probably very smart, probably very motivated, um, but has no idea how to do real life things. What, what happens in most colleges, and you know this, kids get on campus, the first day there's whatever kind of fair there is, and it's sign up for a credit card and get a free t-shirt, and the next thing you know, it's some 18 year old, 18 and a half year old has $2,000 with a credit card debt. 
because they went out and bought everything. They don't understand how it works, why it works, what it does. They don't understand credit. This is a problem. That should, in my opinion, that shouldn't even be allowed on college campuses. That should never, ever even be something that a college campus is allowing to happen. I think ultimately, though, because this isn't part of our education system, um, Austin, that's up to parents right now. I mean, like, who's sitting down with their kids? And I will tell you, I will tie this. I will land the plane on this, I promise. But most parents that I know, and ask yourself to look around, are so concerned with their careers and making money that we forgot something, that we have kids, and then we need to parent the damn kids. So at the end of the day, everybody's worried about how what their future looks like, how much money are they making, are they in the next biggest house, do they have the next Range Rover that's coming out, and I don't, I really hate to soapbox this, but if you spent less time trying to accumulate all those things and more time actually sitting down with your children and teaching them the things that they need to know, we would break the cycle of this problem, yet people forget to do that. And if they do it, they don't do it enough. Yeah, ag agreed. And, and I would even add to that, unfortunately, most of the parents aren't capable of teaching that stuff to their kids because they don't understand it themselves. Touche. Right? And it's because yeah. the, education pro the education system has been this way for so long that people just kind of pick it up and learn along the way. And they're not, I mean, people are walking in to buy a new car and they don't know if they're going to get credit approved, for example, and they're trying to get a loan because they don't understand how credit works. They don't understand how to increase their credit score. They don't know about how to use credit responsibly. They, they, all of these things are not being taught anywhere. And, and that's, I mean, it actually goes back to what you said earlier. You said, you know, certain things are commoditized, right? You can go to Robinhood and buy a stock. You can go online and, and do a you know, mortgage <laughs> transaction. You can buy a car completely online. I've done it, right? And, yep. and so it is, that part of it is commoditized, but you can't commoditize away the value of advice. And, and that's where, you know, if, the, if they're not seeking advice from us as professionals and they're not getting it in the educational system, where are they learning these things? Nowhere. Yeah, there's nowhere to get this information. And I'll tell you, you guys see this as well as I do. Um, it's, it never ceases to amaze me the level of professional that has zero um, financial acumen or understanding of the way the credit system works or the way that compound interest works or the way that anything financially, and I'm, I'm talking about do highly educated people, doctors, CEOs, you, I, one thing I teach our, our people, never ever take for granted that somebody actually knows what, you, what you're about to tell them. Always go through the process. Let them tell you that they already know, figure it out through the process of discovery and telling them. Yeah, agreed. I'll make a quick comment here, then we'll, we'll move on because we, we, we know, Kobe, you got a lot of good nuggets to share with us. We want to extract those. Um, you know, I would even challenge that uh, by the time kids are in high school, that a lot of their, their thoughts and feelings and ideologies towards money are already formed. I, I got involved with an organization a couple years ago. I'm sure you guys both know them, Junior Achievement. And yep. Junior Achievement has a program where they uh, – uh, well, they do a couple of different things, but one of the things they do is they bring kids, physically bring kids in to this uh, makeshift, uh, call it like a uh, job fair kind of, and you come in, you have a budget, you have to pay bills, you have to obtain a mortgage, you have to balance, you know, your checkbook. Um, and I thought that it was just a brilliant program because even though these kids don't necessarily wrap their head around everything that they are learning, their subconscious is going to pick up on some of this stuff that says, oh, that, that might be bad. Oh, this seems like it's, it's good. I'm getting rewarded for this. So that it helps to shape and mold their, their thoughts towards, uh, towards money. And so I just, uh, I thought that that was an incredible program. And I've gone out and I volunteered at this you know, at these job fairs and just watching these kids go through it. It's pretty, pretty incredible. Yeah, that is a good program. I know the program and I agree with you. It does, it does shape habits where basically kids have, have zero, starting at base zero. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Well, that's a good spot to uh, break for a word from our sponsor and we'll come back and we've got plenty more hard hitting questions coming at you. Whether you're an established local company or a brand new startup, you can count on GBS to be part of your family. We're not just any benefits consulting firm, we're GBS. We have nearly 30 years of experience in group benefits, a strong sense of purpose, and it shows. GBS, believe in something better. GBSbenefits.com. All right, tycoons, welcome back. We're here with Kobe Baker, and uh, we were just we're talking about the importance of personal finance and understanding how to uh, to deal with your own personal financial situations. Teach your kids the importance of those sorts of things. So hopefully you're learning a few things here from Kobe, and and uh, you can sense and feel his passion for uh, for personal finance. So Kobe, we re- we really do appreciate that. So I've got to ask a question. How can a company that loans money say they want their clients to be debt free? Seems contradictory. Uh, that's a great question. So I kind of started down this path uh, on the first segment. Um, we know that in America, you're going to buy a house. And it, it's, it makes sense to buy a house in America um, because this ends up being a nest egg. You, 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 we have constant steady appreciation. Real estate is a good investment. That being said, going back to it, you don't have to have a loan all your life. In fact, if you do this the right way, you could move through several houses. And by the time you get to your third house, you could own your house free and clear. Now, there's some, obviously some, some, a little bit of contradictory information, especially when you're talking to financial advisors and I'll explain what I mean. So I've got $500,000 sitting in my house um, when I could, especially in today's day and age where I can get a loan for two and a half percent, right? So the leverage points, are not actually in favor of that, seeing how that 500,000 invested somewhere may do very, very well for money. The problem is, is that most people aren't sophisticated, and this is gonna sound really horrible, but they don't have the background and training. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that back. They have not been given the information necessary to make the types of decisions to understand leverage and how they're leveraging their money. So the easier move on this is to make sure that people are understanding you do not have to be in debt all the way to the end. You don't have to have a 95% loan on your house. You can have equity in your home. You don't need to tap it to buy a boat. You don't need to tap it to do home improvements. Um, this, is, this is what I mean. Ideally, I would think at the end of, at the end of days, um, as we grow old, the ideal scenario would be to have money invested and, and diversified, but also to own your house and to have cash savings and to have money vested in the markets that is a very intelligent and broad-based way to look at things. So for me, it's getting, it's getting an understanding of, of and helping people understand their own risk tolerance, um, their own level of education and understanding of money and finance, and really putting something together that matches the person. Uh, myself, I do have some, some house debt, right? I understand how to leverage that debt. I understand that that Landon uh, can make me more money than my 2% 30-year fixed rate can make. That being said, I probably won't have that loan for the rest of my life either. So it's, it's getting people in a plan to understand the progression of life, when you should be in debt, when you shouldn't be in debt, and understanding that, that if you do get yourself into trouble, say with credit cards, things like that, the ideal scenario is to use something like your home as an instrument or a method to get you out of that, but not to get back into the trouble again, not just at the end to go back out and do it again in five years. So there's, it is a little bit counterintuitive, but I'm extremely passionate about the idea of, um, even if it's the detriment of my business, saying we do not need to be enslaved to our debt. It is critical that we are not enslaved to our debt, that we understand what we're doing. Yeah, so if I were to, I guess, summarize that, I would say that you believe in the smart use of debt, but our, our society believes in the overuse of debt. 100%. Right. And because, I mean, leverage is a real thing, right? The, the reality is, I mean, your financial advisor is kind of, eh, you know, so-so, it sounds like, if, if you're mentioning Landon as your financial advisor, but... <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting That's for right. it. I was waiting for it. <laughs> it, uh, but you're, but you're absolutely right, right? I mean, if if you're paying two and a half percent on a thirty-year fixed rate mortgage, and let's say, for example, you've got a, I don't know, sixty, seventy, maybe even an eighty percent loan to value on that, 
okay, that I could I can still say that that's a smart use of debt. If you're at 90, 95, a hundred percent, I mean, I when I bought my first home back in 2004, you could get a hundred percent financing. Yep. Stated income, stated assets, right? Or even no doc. I mean, it, it was a crazy, crazy time, which is why we had the issue that we had in 2008. Thanks for the memory of that. Uh, I, I appreciate you bringing that back up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it was a, a dark, dark time. Yes. Um, but, you know, it, so many people got into trouble then, you know, I mean, people, people messed around and collateralized and really smart people did a, a crazy, crazy thing, which is really what led us down that. But it came down to, it was too easy to get money. And people didn't understand what they were getting into and just thought, yeah, I can buy a house and I don't need a down payment and I can probably afford that payment. So yeah, let's go for it. Uh, not even understanding whether they, whether they truly can, could, but using leverage, I want to be clear, is a very smart strategy. You just need to use it the right way and understand what you're getting into and, and make sure that the percentages are right. Yep, I agree with that 100%. And I think to piggyback and sort of uh, bring that, that thought to a close, really the thing is, is you have to have the education to know what leverage makes sense. And that's where we need to be focusing. That ties in with the educating you know, young people. There is smart use of leverage, especially in things like business. I mean, using leverage in business is critical in being able to reach the people that you want to reach. It's, it's, it's very difficult to do it organically. Um, so, but it also comes at a cost. So understanding that risk and understanding the numbers, like you said, when it makes sense and when it doesn't, I think that's the real problem is that it's, it's, there's, no, there's no baseline for when it makes sense and when it doesn't. If you're on your second or third or fourth house, you should not be at 95% loan to value on that. You should be taking that equity and being intelligent with how that's rolling on into other investments and or your next purchases. So there's a way to do it and there's a way not to do it. Yep. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So Co Kobe, it, it's very apparent that you are, you've got a lot of passion around helping facilitate positive transformational change with, I'll just say with, with people, maybe an extra kind of focus on the youth there, which um, I think makes a ton of sense. Uh, just because as adults, we are more set in our ways. We are um, not quite as, as open-minded, you know, as, as younger people tend to be. So let me, let me kind of um, take that and lead that into the next question, which is like, so, um, what types of companies kind of kind of moving forward, you know, what kind of companies will help to create this kind of change and innovation that we're talking with in the, you know, the coming years? Yeah, I think that companies that are, are willing to be, well, first of all, I think one of the critical components is bringing, and I'm going to go back to it, bringing youth in um, a more idealistic approach to business versus a simple profit driven mentality. So I think companies that right now are starting to get smart about how they are gearing their, their growth or their progress as a company around younger generations. Because the reason why I focus on, on the youth is exactly what you said. It's very hard to change somebody who's been doing something 40 years. I know how much I have to fight against the things that I am talking you know, to people about, I have to do the same. I have to check myself the same way. I go, no, I don't need, I don't need that. I'm just doing it because somebody put it in front of my face. So I think the companies that will be aggressive in how they're bringing in um, innovation from the younger generation, the leadership, these are the policymakers of the future. Everybody, every generation forgets. Um, and I think we're all three, you're a little younger than Austin, Austin and I, but I think every generation forgets that the generation behind us will be the ones making the policies at some point in time. And usually they'll be making the policies when we're old and can't make the policies any longer. That the interesting component about the, the, the trajectory of where things are going is if we can bring enough innovation and intelligence in from, from a group of people that see things differently than baby boomers, Gen X, things like that, 
I, the, the generations like that, I think what you'll see is companies changing their attitude to, to business. You'll, ch you'll see the change from pure profit driven to how much do we really need? How much are we giving back to the community? What's our social responsibility? What's our environmental responsibility? What are all of these other factors instead of looking at just one thing? How much money are we making? When you get, I, and that's where I'm banking and betting on the next generation of leaders. And I think the companies that are aggressively going after at, at, at shaping and mentoring that next generation of leaders, bringing them into leadership at very young ages, uh, taking the ideas and not just shunning this philosophy of an, a world that, that has a little bit more of an idealistic approach to it. I think companies that do that are going to be the companies that emerge from the future. I do believe at some point there will be some massive revolution against pure profit companies. I think that the, if you look at the pure demographics of the generations behind us that have, have, have seen a different way of doing things, I think at some point in time, there will be a massive revolution against the big, you know, the man, you know, the, 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 what's what we've been fighting since the, the late seventies. So I, I hope that answers your question. I know it may have got off topic a little bit, but I think it's people that are focused on, the companies that are focused on bringing in the new talent, bringing in a new way of thought and shifting gears away from profit only driven mentalities. Yeah, I think there's value there. Um, you know, I, I just, I mentioned earlier, my 17 year old daughter just started her senior year of high school and uh, I actually just hired her to be my administrative assistant. My current assistant moved to Portland and it just, it wasn't going to be the right fit to do it remotely that way. And, and so I made a decision to bring my daughter in, which in my estimation was risky because she's my daughter, right? Um, I don't know that I would consider anybody that's 17 years old to be risky, but with it being my daughter and my, my family business, it, it was risky. But I'll tell you what, I think that, I mean, we're here hosting a radio program and a podcast. Not all businesses understand the value of doing something like this anyway. And so I think that, you know, Landon and I and you are, you know, more innovative than a lot of business owners of our generation, right? Mm -hmm. But the real value for me bringing her in and, and obviously my son's probably going to come to work for me here in the next year or so as well. Uh, he's older. Uh, is that what you just mentioned and me understanding that there's probably some things that I still don't see, right? I I'm pretty good with social media, but maybe there's something they know that I don't, or maybe they, you know, they're going to come in and start to dive in and I'm going to show them certain things in the way that we do things. And my daughter and my son are going to look at it and say, but why do you do it that way? There's a, there's a better or more efficient way of doing it. If you did this, we could automate this, we could do this, you know, it, it's, they, they look at the world differently than we do. And it, I think it's beneficial. Uh, Austin, I mean, first of all, kudos for bringing them in. Cause I am a firm believer in that. I mean, who better to learn from than you and vice versa you learn from them. Um, I think the key is, is, is allowing uh, this generation to ask questions um, and teaching them to question, um, right? Which is, which is also a little counterintuitive to how most of us are raised, which is don't question. Don't question authority. Don't question the people that are telling you what to do. Uh, instead, I encourage that. And that's what I found. I have two people that are under the age of 20 in our organization, um, which is pretty unique because this is a, a very technical, and as I mentioned, a very uh, mature business. So what I found is that when you are forced to answer questions and or explain your way of doing things, there are times when you actually answer that question and realize um, that was really stupid when I say it out loud to somebody who doesn't understand it. And I think that that, you know, that kind of is what I'm talking about when I'm, when I'm talking about innovation and if you can, and if you can find the right balance and make sure that that your son and your daughter are free to ask questions and question why you do things, you will find that that one of two things happens. They may have a great idea, like you said, or you may just be explaining it and realize that you're just doing it that way because somebody told you to do it that way. And you just basically are repeating the same thing, which is a problem. I mean, we all know that's a problem. Anybody intelligent knows that's a problem. 
so it, it inspires you to do some different things. I've, I, I hired um, my basically executive assistant is 23. And I did that on purpose. Um, for one, I would have to explain everything that I did, which would make me think about it instead of just randomly going along with every preconceived notion I've ever had or built up in 45 years. But for two, the, the bright eyed, bushy tailness of somebody that's 19, 20, 23 is entirely different from somebody who's got the crap kicked out of them for the last 20 years in the workforce and they don't know what good is out there. So there's a lot of ways this can be invigorating and I think it can help businesses if they're open to it, which, you know, to be honest with you, I don't see that a lot of places are. So kudos to you on bringing those guys in. I'm, I'm guessing that that's gonna, you're gonna look back on that and think that it was a really great decision and so are they. Yeah, I sure, I sure hope so. Cause you know, family for me is number one anyway. I mean, everything that I do from a business standpoint is, is for my family. Um, and for me, it's rewarding to hear my 20 year old son now who's studying sports journalism at Arizona state, you know, finally admit that what dad does for a living's not got to be the most boring thing in the world. And why would I ever <laughs> want to do that? Sweet vindication. <laughs> He, he's now thinking that it's something that would be pretty cool and maybe I should want to work with dad and, and uh, you know, you get to help people and you know, it's, it's, it's rewarding. And I think it'll be a great, hopefully for me, it becomes the, my succession plan for my business and they're able to run it as I get a little bit older and do certain things. I mean, not to toot my own horn, but, you know, speaking of, of doing things that are socially responsible and giving back, you know, I'm, I'm for, well, actually, I guess you're a year older than me. I'm 44. I was born in 76. Um, and so by the time I'm 55, my goal is to work one out of every three years or so I'm sorry, work two out of every three years and take one year off and go and do something big somewhere. Right. My wife and I both speak French. And so we would love to spend some time in French speaking Africa, you know, digging wells, wells, doing anything that we can to kind of make things better for a lot of people that are underserved. And I can only do that. So this is where, you know, profit still has to be important. Right. I yep. can only do that if I have a business that's that's sustainable and that's being run by people that I can trust to run it appropriately while I'm gone for that year. Yeah, that's, oh, yeah, that's, my that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. I think setting things up that way. I mean, you and I are cut from the same cloth is that I, my intention is to make it so my presence is not necessary in any of my businesses. Uh, but they run the same as if I were there simply for the fact that there, there's nothing that can be replaced by you going and doing that work. There's no donation of money. There's nothing that you can do that will outweigh you going and doing the work. And I do wanna say, listen, profit is part of business. It, it's part of what keeps it going. It, it, you know, passion, profit, purpose, um, the, the, the triangle of, of, of what I think business should be about. The reality of this is if you don't have profit, you don't have a business. The question is, is how much profit do you need? That's the critical component. How much do you need? Does any human being need a billion dollars? I mean, you can answer that question on your own, uh, but I know where I stand on that. Does any human being need a hundred million dollars? And this is where, you know, these are tough questions. I'm not a communist, I'm not a socialist, but these are questions that we are not stopping to ask right now. And our businesses don't stop and ask them either. They just keep going for the next level, the next level, the next level. Yeah. But can I join you in Africa? I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm down it. with that for sure. Yeah, yeah, we'll uh, we'll we'll do a trip together. Yeah, I think that would be awesome. Landon will still be well. I guess he'll be done changing diapers by then, but uh, no, he'll still not. be in the thick of raising kids for sure. Yeah, he can't go. <laughs> Sorry, Landon. That's all right. That's all right. I'll, I'll join you guys via Zoom. You can. I can live through uh, through your guys' <laughs> work. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, yeah, awesome. Go ahead. No, no, I was, I, I was actually stopping for you to jump in. Yeah. Um, so just, this is just going back to just everything that you've kind of shared with us, Kobe. Um, I think your approach is really unique. I think it uh, just coincidentally, it, it aligns very closely with, with Austin and I's kind of approach to business. But for other people that might be listening to this saying, hey, this all sounds great, but I've kind of been doing my own thing for the last 
decade, two decades, three decades, and in, in trying to adapt and, and um, make some hard changes, you know, my, my question is, like, can you give us a couple of examples of, of specifically what some businesses can do to help facilitate this change in, in younger folks? I mean, is it more internship programs? Is it mentorships? You know, what are, what are maybe just one or two things that our listeners can say, hey, I think that's something that I can, I can do. That seems manageable to me. Yeah, I think you've got to have, uh, it's, a great, it's a great question. It's a challenging question. First of all, I think you have to have something to offer. Um, this interesting thing about this generation is, is they have great BS meters. Um, and, and I think you'll learn this because your kids are going to grow up with a great BS meter as well. They know phonies and they know, they know things that don't align with what they believe or what they're starting to think. So I think the first thing that you have to do as a leader of an organization is you actually have to have something that's different than what everybody else is doing. So the first thing is, is you have to make hard decisions for yourself and, and ask yourself, are you really doing something different than what is this, the standard norm? Do, have you deviated? Are you providing some value at a greater level to your community, the people inside your organization and the people outside your organization that are doing business with you? Um, you've got to ask that very difficult question first. And I think the second component is you have to act on it. It has to be important enough for you to want to pass that information or knowledge down to somebody or see that change. Most people don't bring in youth because they don't, they, they are focused on one thing and one thing alone and that's making money. And that is not a money maker. A lot of times, listen, we will take, have our people in, we will pay to train them. We will pay for the training and they will not monetize some of them, not ever. 25 to 30% will never monetize. They will be a cost, of, a, a cost of doing business the way we do business. The others might take six months or a year until they actually start to contribute to the business you're doing. So this is something you got to really believe in doing. From there, you have to ask yourself, you know, what, what value does that group of people bring to the business? And you have to be very, very clear and very concise as to what that value is because that determines, are you going to bring people in on an internship um, one of my good friends that owns a manufacturing plant in Cleveland um, is now traveling the, the country speaking about his internship program where he's taking, granted, manufacturing is not a sexy industry any longer, right? This is not, you know, 1950. So where he's going into colleges and he's got a whole system set up that, that really is intended to see which kids are going to take to manufacturing and engineering and then he's bringing them into the fold via an internship. And he's not only is he training them to come into his organization, but he's training them to go out to other organizations because he can't take all of them. So he's taking the ones that fit best with his scheme. And then he's farming them out to other people in the industry. So he's investing in himself. He's investing in the kids. And he's ultimately investing in his competitors as well. This is not, once again, I'll go back, it's not a super popular way of doing business. Most people slap you around from the old school of business. So you really got to be dedicated to it. And from there, you got to decide what kind of impact you can have. Even if it's just going and speaking to kids in your area, if it's sponsoring, like we were talking about Dave Ramsey programs for financial literacy, if it's going in and talking to the young people about what business could and should look like, if it's taking an, an internship, uh, taking on an internship program, if it is building a mentor program where you may just talk to, to you know, a group of kids once every two weeks for an hour, you just got to do something. And it just really, it ultimately boils down to how important of a move is it to you as a business leader, a community leader, and, uh, and somebody who's trying to make an impact. Yeah, well said, well said. I think you know, in my, in my career, I've been doing this, I don't, you know, call it about 10 years. Um, another thing that's been kind of challenging to me is to, to find, to find a mentor. Because when I, when I hear about, uh, you know, the experts talk about, you know, mentorship, it, it, you hear something along the lines of, well, it has to be mutually beneficial you have to be able to bring something to the table for them. I've always had 
I've always had an issue with that. And let me, let me explain what I mean. When you're young and you're starting out in a business and you know next to nothing about that business or that industry, you don't know how to get clients. You don't know how to process orders. You don't know how to do this. You don't know how to do that because you have to learn. And when you have a mentor, it makes it so much, it just, it fast tracks your ability to, to get to a point where you're a lot more productive as, as an employee. But it doesn't seem like people want to do that because if, if there's not something directly in it for them, then it, it's not something they want to invest their time into. Does that make sense what I'm saying? I'd, I'd like to, you know, I'd love yeah, to hear your thoughts on that. I think it's a great point. And I, and I, you know, probably you guys are going to look back on this call and be like, boy, that guy beat the dead horse. But it's because people are um, too focused on the, the, the aspect that's making them money. People, mentors are out there. They're tired. They've been ground down. You know what I mean? They're, they've been taught to look at things from a standpoint of what's their gain from it versus the intrinsic gain of actually passing along the information that you may have learned the hard way. This is, these are culture shifts. I mean, these are very difficult culture shifts. And when you start to take away from like why people don't teach other people, because usually they're talking about it taking away from their own livelihood. But why is it that we have not set things up to need less so you can give more? I mean, this is a really, these are really simple problems. They're not easy. Um, and I think that it goes back to that. Why, uh, you know, I looked for business mentors for years. In fact, I, I had, I was part of groups. I did, I did so much when I was in my twenties and thirties because I started my first business at 19 and ultimately half of them just fell off. Half of them didn't want to give me the information. So it's like, this is not mentoring. This is a real issue that I think is, is, you know, really pointed towards what's, what's happening now, what business has become what we have made it in our modern day society. It's just not that productive. It's not that fun. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm to call me a fool. It's not that fun to do that. It's more fun when people are enthusiastic and add and, and, can, and can learn and can enrich the business and can enrich your product or your service. It's just, it just is far more fulfilling and it costs money and it takes time. So how do you balance that? You got to get in a position. Public companies can't balance it because they're busy, you know, answering to shareholders and boards. Public or private companies, sometimes you're just busy trying to scrape by. You know, there's a better way to do it. And until we get serious about it, I think probably what's going to happen is we're going to keep grinding on in, the, in this, you know, wicked machine that we've built. Yeah. A lot of the work that Austin and I do with business owners is around um, you know, business succession planning and helping to, to shift that mindset to where when you're ultimately looking to get out of your business, whatever that looks like, is that business succession planning is really, you know, just, and this is a quote from the Exit Planning Institute, a, a, a group that I'm kind of involved in, is that it's just good, it's good business strategy. Because when you're thinking about getting out of your business, you have to look at your business through the lens of a potential buyer, right? So my, my question for you is, and we're bumping right up against time here, but I think this is a great way to end our conversation. You have made a lot of really great points. Um, you brought up some, some issues you're clearly really passionate about. So the work that you're doing to help mentor and develop and involve the youth for all these great reasons. How do you encapsulate that into your company so that for your own succession plan, that all of this great stuff that you're doing kind of lives on in, in, in perpetuity? Yeah, a great way to finish. I think the key is, is you have to, you have to build a culture that is basically where, where people are engaged to own what they do and where they have the authority to make the decisions. I don't like to use the word empower, but at the end of the day, I believe 
my truest value and when I've actually accomplished what I want to accomplish is when I can walk away from any one of my businesses and they do not need me for day to day. They don't need me. I could be gone for a month. I like what Austin said. I'd be gone for a year and I could come right back and the same core values are being, uh, our core convictions are being upheld no matter the business. Whatever we determine that to be, the next generation is continuing that on. You have to do that through culture. You have to do that through a methodology that, that um, the youth have, they have the understanding they can, they can make these decisions and they can affect the change. We're, we got a group of entrepreneurs. That's what I love to call them. They want to be entrepreneurs. They don't want all the pain in the ass that comes with being an entrepreneur. Everybody wants to say that's wanting to have your cake and eat it too, but it sounds fine to me. It sounds great because if you can harness this idea of wanting to, to play a huge role in, in the direction of companies and the direction of policies and things like that, but there's only a limited responsibility level, it curbs power too. It curbs the problem that we see in politics and business and the corruption that we see in, in businesses at the top. You've seen it, I've seen it. There's a way to balance all of these things out. And I think that is the answer. I think to, to bring it home, the answer is involving this group of people and their thought process and processes and what they've seen to create a little bit different way of doing business that is a little bit more idealistic and cares a little bit more about the holistic aspect of everything that is involved in business. And I think when you do that, I think we can create some things that will be true wins for the community, the people that work in the organizations and, this, and the services and the products that we provide for people. Amen. That's about all I can say after that. Um, we, we really appreciated having you here, Kobe. Uh, just wrap up and give us real quick, you know, website, social media, where people can find you. And we really appreciate you being on the show with us. Yep. You can find me on LinkedIn or Facebook. Pretty easy. Kobe Baker, not a hard one. C-O-B-Y-B-A-K-E-R. Um, Alderis is www.alderis.net. Um, and I'll leave those. The other two, probably not, not super sexy businesses. So, uh, I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. All oh, right. phone number. I will give you that. If you do yeah. want to learn about uh, any of our internship programs, any of our new hire programs, or if you want to uh, uh, see what it's like to, to experience our services, uh, you can reach us at 702-255-5783. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kobe. Thanks, Thanks a lot, guys. Kobe. Really, really appreciate you guys having me. Appreciate you, man. Thanks, guys. You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mance. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite podcast platform. All right, we're clear. We are clear. Cool. Still on video, but we're off air. Excellent, fast-paced conversation. That was great. Are you part of Conscious Capitalism organization, Kobe? Uh, no, but my brother is. Okay, very good. So we are sitting in the studio at the Conscious Capitalism headquarters here in Arizona, and they're one of my sponsors. Oh, yeah, that's cool. We've got the Conscious ah. Capitalism credo on the wall, and... Uh, yeah, it, everything you spoke to speaks volumes, not only to Landon Austin, but uh, myself and the rest of the team here at Max 6. So well done. Good. Thank yeah, you. let me um, pop up and take a couple photos real quick, and then we'll let you guys get out of here. Um, Austin, yeah, bring it, see if you can bring yourself down. I'm going to take... Toby, I've got your office uh, calling you right now. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Do, I'm going to do a... Let's see. I wanted to get one of those. Uh, yeah. Can you guys smile at the camera or at your camera real quick? And I'm just going to, I'm still recording and I'll shut it off. So smiling. All right. Now the recording is off. That's weird.